In this video we're going to be looking at the benefits and drawbacks of globalization. This is part one of a two-part video series. We'll be looking at the main features of globalization, benefits and drawbacks of globalization for developed and developing countries, and finally we'll look at some ethical and sustainability considerations. In part two of this video series we'll be looking at specific effects of globalization on the UK. Let's start by looking at what globalization is. Globalization refers to the growing integration and interdependence of the world's economies. We'll be breaking this down now. So starting off with the growing integration of the world's economies. Most markets are no longer geographically confined. They are truly global. In other words, consumers and producers thousands of miles away can exchange goods and money. Whereas in the past, this may not have been possible. You would only have been able to exchange goods, trade goods and services with people geographically close to you. But like I said, this is no longer the case. Another way in which the world's economies are becoming more integrated is the increasing global nature of capital flows. Capital flows are movements of money to finance investment, and these are becoming more and more global. For example, it's possible now for an American firm to get a loan from a European bank to build a factory in France. Also, Chinese investors can buy shares in companies in the UK. People can put savings in different countries. So you can see how, compared to the past, when capital flows were very highly regulated, today is completely different. Capital flows are much more global. And the world's economies have become closer and closer due to this. With this integration, however, comes increased interdependence. As economies are no longer fully isolated from each other, as we've seen with the growing integration of the world's economies as part of globalization, events in one economy can have profound effects in other economies. For example, the 2008 financial crisis or the COVID-19 pandemic. If there is a recession in one country, in a globalized world, this could be detrimental for firms in other countries whose consumers are mainly in that country. And so it's clear with this interdependence that changes in consumer demand in one country can have profound effects on the success of firms in other countries. And this is all a sign of the increased interdependence of the world's economies. So why has globalization taken place? Firstly, improvements in technology. Instant global data transmission through the internet has made it easier for companies to operate in different countries without having to set up expensive offices in those countries. This is one of the reasons why multinational companies, or MNCs, which we'll get onto later, have increased in number. The rise of the internet has also brought the rise of online shopping which has allowed consumers to easily get access to goods from around the world, all from the comfort of their own home. Secondly, improvements in international transport networks. Over time, as aeroplanes have become more efficient, the cost of flying has fallen. As you can see with this graph, the real cost per mile of air travel over time from 1979 to 2011 has nearly halved. This has encouraged globalization as it has made it easier and cheaper for companies to set up operations overseas. This is because it's now cheaper and quicker for managers to fly abroad in order to manage operations in different countries. Thirdly, deregulation. There's been over time a lowering of trade barriers such as tariffs and quotas and an increase in free trade. We can see from this picture the EU alone has been engaging in negotiations to forge free trade agreements with different countries. In essence, the fall in the level of state intervention has allowed global markets to flourish, allowing globalization to take place. And lastly, the growth of multinational companies. A multinational company or an MNC is a firm that owns or controls production of goods and services in at least one country other than its home country. For example, if you have a firm based in America and it owns production plants in Europe, in Asia, then that company is an MNC. MNCs are formed mainly due to two reasons. Economies of scale is one of them. 
If you haven't seen my video on economies of scale, I highly recommend you do that. The cost benefits provided by economies of scale of growing a business, in this case making it global and opening that company up to global markets and foreign consumers, allows MNCs to reduce their average cost of production and maximize profit. It's also a case of brand loyalty in marketing. There are some brands which are internationally recognized and therefore there may be demand for these brands, these companies to serve foreign consumers as well. Examples of these are Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon and Microsoft. Just taking the example of Apple, we know that Apple is a world-renowned brand and therefore foreign consumers, understandably, will also want to get their hands on the latest iPhone. It makes sense for Apple to set up factories around the world, such as its manufacturing plant in China, in order to meet this heavy demand. Now let's look at the benefits to developed countries of globalization. Firstly, higher profits for MNCs. Globalization opens up foreign markets and foreign consumers to MNCs. This means that instead of solely occupying a relatively small domestic market, which is at risk of becoming saturated over time, giving MNCs access to global markets allows them to sell more of their goods or services, allowing them to make higher profits. Secondly, greater consumer choice. Greater consumer choice is also a benefit. Due to more countries exporting goods as part of globalization, this means that consumers have more choice, allowing them to buy and experience goods from different countries and different cultures. An example of this is world cuisine. Just think about how many different restaurants and different cuisines you can find in your local area. This is all due to cultural globalization. In other words, an increasing integration of world cultures. Globalization has also led to greater efficiency and therefore lower prices for consumers. As globalization in part refers to the opening up of previously heavily guarded domestic markets to form a big global market, there is obviously greater competition between firms of different countries. This forces companies to adopt the most efficient working practices they can in order to reduce costs of production and provide competitive prices for consumers. Going back to MNCs, MNCs having access to global markets allows them to grow and therefore take advantage of economies of scale which increase productive efficiency and therefore lead to cost benefits which can be passed down to consumers in the form of lower prices. But what about developing countries? How do but what about developing countries? How do developing countries benefit from globalization? Well, firstly, there's a chain of higher GDP leading to lower unemployment and higher living standards. Firstly, FDI or foreign direct investment into a developing country will lead to increased production levels. This will in turn increase these countries' GDP levels because remember, GDP is a measure of the value of goods and services produced in a country over a given period of time. The fact that production levels have increased will obviously increase the derived demand for labour. In other words, because businesses are producing more, there will inevitably be a need for more labour in order to take part in the production process to produce this increased quantity of goods and services. This leads to lower unemployment. More workers being hired means that more people in those countries receive wages and these incomes will allow workers to sustain higher living standards. Secondly, an increase in tax revenue for the developing countries' governments. As explained previously, we know that globalization can benefit MNCs through increased profits and benefit workers through increased incomes. Both of these are potential sources of tax revenue for the government, as the government can impose corporate tax, a tax on company profits, and can impose higher income tax. All this means higher tax receipts for the government, which they can use to provide higher quantity and quality of public goods, which could involve putting more police officers on the streets to reduce crime, or to increase social welfare provisions. Exports can also benefit due to globalization. 
Developing countries often find it difficult to enter global markets due to excessive global competition and a lack of know-how, making productive efficiency in developing countries lower than that in developed countries. Naturally, the exports of goods and services produced by an MNC in a developing country boost the exports of that developing country. This will help to improve the current account of the balance of payments. And if you've seen my government objectives video, you'll know that a balanced current account is one objective, one macroeconomic objective shared by many countries. Fourthly, the transmission of cutting edge technologies is beneficial for developing countries. MNCs bring with them a wealth of knowledge regarding working practices, technology, etc. And all this can help developing countries' businesses adapt their own processes and business practices to increase productive efficiency and therefore drive down costs of production and make these businesses more competitive in global markets. And lastly, enterprise development. Inward FDI, foreign direct investment, into a developing country carried out by a multinational corporation may encourage local citizens in those developing countries receiving the FDI to set up businesses providing ancillary services, such as accommodation for workers or transport and cleaning services. The setting up of these businesses will benefit yet more workers by providing more job opportunities, and this will undoubtedly bring more prosperity. However, there are some drawbacks of globalization, chief of which is environmental damage. Global economic growth can lead to environmental damage in many ways, but here are two. Firstly, we know that the cost of flying has gone down. This has made it easier and cheaper and more accessible for people to take flights, to move from place to place, rather than taking alternatives such as train or public transport in general. The increase in air travel inevitably has led to more air pollution. Global economic growth has also led to the depletion of non-renewable resources, such as iron ore, coal, oil and gas. This is because there's been an increase in global demand for goods and services which need these non-renewable resources to be produced. Both of these lead to environmental damage. Another concerning drawback of globalization is the exploitation of developing countries. In order to attract FDI into their countries, developing countries often put in place tax rebates and weak labour regulation in order to make it worthwhile for MNCs to come in and set up production plants. The tax breaks and tax rebates mean that developing countries may not receive high tax revenues at all, and lower tax revenues going to the host nation mean that the profits made by MNCs will probably mostly go to the developed country that that MNC came from. Weak labour regulation is a real problem because this means poor working conditions and poor wages, especially if there's no minimum wage in that country for workers. And therefore, although globalisation has allowed MNCs to make more profit, it may not have been completely beneficial for developing countries. There's also the issue of structural unemployment. The offshoring of production to countries with loose labour regulations, uh, like I said, with no minimum wage, for example, can lead to an increase in structural unemployment and or lower wages in developed countries to keep domestic production competitive. Globalisation can also lead to a rise in inequality and relative poverty. Workers who have already trained in areas where a country has a comparative advantage will likely benefit from globalisation. This will lead to them having higher living standards. However, workers who work in sectors that cannot compete with global competitors will find globalisation to be particularly disadvantageous. It's very likely that these people will face structural unemployment as these sectors die out due to them being unable to compete with businesses overseas. Without doubt then, globalisation has led to lower living standards for these workers. Lastly, there are also some ethical and sustainability considerations we're going to look at now. The ethical considerations are in orange and the sustainability considerations are in green. We just talked about the issue of structural unemployment and the issues that can cause in developed countries.
In the next video, I'm going to be looking at the UK and specific examples of this in the UK, as we can see how many workers in the UK are being affected by global competition due to globalization, which has led to their sectors becoming gradually more and more uncompetitive over time. There's also the issue of brain drain. Brain drain is when highly skilled workers in developing countries move to work and live in developed countries in order to obtain higher living standards. This has become more and more possible due to the increased global freedom of movement of people. Although this is good for the individuals in question moving to improve their living standards, there's an ethical issue because the developing countries who are certainly in need of highly skilled labour are losing this labour because of globalisation. As mentioned at the start of this video, interdependence is also a quality attributed to globalisation, and it can also pose an ethical issue. We know that interdependence means that events going on in one country's economy can have profound impacts on individuals, firms, and economies in general in other countries. The issue here is, if a government fails to avoid a recession, this not only has detrimental impacts on that country's firms and that country's consumers, but it also has detrimental impacts on that country's trading partners. Globalisation, leading to increased movement of people and increased movement of goods worldwide, can also lead to a health issue. As we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic, the sheer scale of movement of goods, services and people in and out of China to the rest of the world can lead to the spread of contagious diseases. This is also an ethical consideration worth making when you try to determine whether globalisation is overall a good or a bad thing. Looking to the sustainability consideration here, the depletion of natural resources is a real problem which has been exacerbated by globalisation. We've already explained how the increase in global demand for goods and services has partly led to the depletion of natural resources. And one of these natural resources is palm oil. Palm oil is an oil with very useful properties that make it very useful in the production of other goods, such as butter spreads. Naturally, the increased demand for these goods and services has led to the increased demand for palm oil. Firms scrambling to increase their palm oil production have resorted to deforestation in order to clear space to grow palm oil trees. This is having a huge negative impact on biodiversity, leading to species of animals becoming endangered because of this deforestation. Therefore, globalisation not only has an impact on humans, but it has an impact on the nature that we use to produce goods and services that we consume. And this is something we really do have to consider. We've reached the end of part one. Here's a relevant news article you can use to test your knowledge of globalization. Thank you very much for listening, and please stay tuned for part two.